It happened when I was only 16 years old, but it is a moment I will never forget. It is a moment that seems like it happened to me just yesterday. Just a few weeks before the moment of which I speak, I, as a 16-year-old, had received the prized treasure every 16-year-old young man wants, and that is a driver's license. And I remember one Saturday evening, my cousin called me. We lived in Eugene, Oregon, and he called me and he said, tomorrow morning, Sunday morning, I'm going to drive up to Hood River, Oregon, about 150 miles away from where we lived, and listen to uh, our uncle preach. My uncle was a pastor in Hood River, Oregon, and so my cousin said, would you like to go with me? And I said, oh, that would be awesome. And so I remember waiting at my house and early on a very cold Sunday morning, he pulled up in his car and he uh, asked me a question. He said, would you like to drive? And asking a 16 year old who just got his driver's license if he wanted to drive, it's like asking my wife if she wants chocolate ice cream. <laughs> and I said, of course. And so we began driving north on Interstate 5, and we were having a wonderful, wonderful time just talking together. And we were just south of Portland, Oregon. I was in the far left lane of four lanes headed north on the Interstate 5, and we just went down under an overpass when suddenly, unexpectedly, and without warning, the nose of the car hit a patch of black ice and dove into the center concrete divider. The impact spun the car around. And here, as a 16-year-old inexperienced driver, the car is sliding backwards. And I'm looking into four lanes of oncoming traffic. I didn't have time to think. And even if I would have, I wouldn't have known what to do. It was just instinct in that moment as I was looking at those cars coming at me. I cried out, Jesus help me. Jesus help me. And all of a sudden, the car whirled around, moved over to the side of the freeway, slowed down and came to a stop. And I assure you, it wasn't because I was a good driver. <laughs> it was a miracle. God had rescued me. And I learned in that moment what I've seen so many times in my life. I learned in that moment what so many of you in this room know. And that is that God's help is only a prayer way. That no matter who you are, and no matter where you are, and no matter what is going on in your life, if you cry out to God, our God is a God who hears and answers prayer. And this is why God's people have so loved Psalm 107, because it is a psalm all about the power of prayer. It is a psalm all about how God answers prayer. Now, this psalm was written at the very end of the Old Testament era. The Jews had gone into captivity and then been released from captivity. They went back to the land of Israel and they rebuilt their temple. And this psalm was written as they reflect back across all of the Old Testament. And they call to mind how many times God heard them when they cried out to him. How many times God rescued and delivered them. And in this psalm, there's a key phrase. It is the phrase, then they cried out to the Lord in their trouble, and he delivered them from out of their distresses. Not once, not twice, not three times, but four times. In that, this psalm, you find that phrase repeated. Look in Psalm 107 in verse 6. Then they cried out to the Lord in their trouble, and he delivered them out of their distresses. Verse 13. Then they cried out to the Lord in their trouble, and he saved them or delivered them out of their distresses. 
Look at verse 19. Then they cried out to the Lord in their trouble, and he saved them or delivered them out of their distresses. Verse 28. Then they cried out to the Lord in their trouble, and he brings them out, he delivers them, he saves them out of their distresses. Four times you find that phrase. Because in this psalm, you find four different locations where God answered prayer. Four different situations in which God's people found themselves and he answered their prayer. As we're going to see in verse 4 to 7, all of a sudden, as it were, you are transported out into the middle of a wilderness. And there you see some fainting travelers. They're lost in the desert. They need food and water. And when they cry out to the Lord, he hears them and answers their prayer. And then all of a sudden, you're transported from that wilderness into a dungeon. And there you find captives who are bound. And they need to be set free. And they cry out to the Lord. He answers their prayer. And he brings them out of that captivity. And then all of a sudden you're transported from the dungeon into a hospital. And there you find a sick patient on a deathbed about ready to die. And that person cries out to the Lord. And God hears their cry and heals them. And then all of a sudden you're transported out into the middle of the ocean in a terrible, horrible storm. And a group of sailors cry out to the Lord, and the Lord hears their cry and delivers them. And it shows whether you're lost in the desert, whether you are locked in a dungeon, whether you are lying on a deathbed, or whether you're laboring out in the deep, God answers prayer. And maybe... Maybe you're here tonight and you feel like you're in the wilderness and you need God to provide. If that's, if that's you, this psalm is for you. <laughs> Maybe you feel like you're in a dungeon of sorts and you need God to bring freedom to your life. Listen, Psalm 107 is for you. <laughs> Maybe you're a person who has sickness in your life or you know someone who has sickness in their life and they need healing. Listen, Psalm 107 is for you. <laughs> Maybe you are in a storm. You feel like you're in a raging, the worst storm of your life. If that's true, Psalm 107 is for you. Because it's a psalm all about how God answers prayer. Notice how this great psalm begins. It begins with an introduction in verses 1 to 3. The psalmist writes, Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for He is good. God is good all the time and all the time God is good. God is gooder than good. And how do you know that he is gooder than good? Well, for his mercy endures forever. In Lamentation chapter 3 verse 23, the steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. He is Mercy never comes to an end. It is new every morning. Great is God's faithfulness. Day after day after day after day after day after day after day, the mercy of the Lord is new. The loving kindness of God is new. The steadfast love of the Lord is new. Oh, give thanks to the Lord for He is good, for His mercy endures forever. Let the redeemed of the Lord... Say so, whom he has redeemed from the hand of the enemy and gathered out of the lands from the east and the west and from the north and from the south. Notice verse 2, let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Now the word redeemed often in the Bible is used of making a payment to buy someone out of slavery. But the word ga'al here in Hebrew means much more than that. It means literally, let the rescued of the Lord say so. Let the delivered of the Lord say so. Let anyone who's saved by God in any kind of way say so. Oh, I like this. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Not think so, not feel so, but say so. If God has answered your prayer, if God has rescued you, 
If God has delivered you, then say so. <laughs> I remember when I was a boy growing up in church on Sunday nights as a part of the worship time. They used to have what they called testimony time. <laughs> testimony time. And what would happen is one after another. We used to do this in the early days of Calvary. And one after another, somebody would raise their hand and stand and say, you know what, I was out of a job, I prayed, and God gave me a job. Woohoo! <laughs> and someone would say, you know, in my marriage, I, I think, thought we were headed for divorce, but we prayed, and God brought us back together. Praise the Lord. Another person would say, I, I had a prodigal son that was wandering out in the world, and we prayed, and God answered that prayer. Testimony time. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Let us open our mouth and tell about how God has answered prayer, how God has rescued us, how God has delivered us. And then the psalm describes different situations, different circumstances in which you might find yourself. And when you cry out to God, he answers your prayer. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Then all of a sudden you're transported out into the middle of the wilderness. And in verses 4 to 9, you see how God answers prayer. Verse 4, they wandered in the wilderness. In a desolate way, they found no city to dwell in. Hungry and thirsty, their soul fainted in them. Then they cried out to the Lord in their trouble. And he delivered them out of their distresses. He led them forth by the right way that they may go to a city for a dwelling place. Oh, oh, that men would give thanks to the Lord for his goodness and for his wonderful works to the children of men. Verse 9, for he satisfies the longing soul and he fills the hungry soul with goodness. Listen, when you need provision and you cry out to God, he will hear and answer your prayer. Now, the Old Testament saints, when they were reading verse 4 to 9, they couldn't help think of what happened when they, as the people, were out in the wilderness. You remember, they went out of the land of Egypt, and they began to walk throughout the wilderness, and it is believed there were some three million of them. And they had no food, and they had no water. What to do? Look to the Lord. And God brought water out of the rock. God, God brought bread down from heaven. And they learned that when you look to the Lord, He can provide for your needs. New Testament believers, when they read this portion of Psalm 107, they couldn't help but think of Jesus feeding the 5,000. The Bible says there were 5,000 men but with women and children, some 20,000 people. And it says they all ate and were filled. They were totally stuffed. They were totally filled because Jesus provided for their needs. And dear ones, if God provided for his people in the Old Testament, and if Jesus provided in that kind of way in the New Testament, then God can provide for you and for me. In Philippians 4 and verse 19, the Bible says, And my God will supply all of your needs according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. I like how David said in Psalm 37, verse 25, he said, I've never seen the righteous forsaken, and I've never seen their seed begging bread. God's people over and over and over and every day and every time and every place, when they've been in need and they cry out to the Lord, he provides for their need. No one saw that more than a great man of God in the 1800s named George Mueller. George Mueller lived in London and he founded orphanages for thousands and thousands of orphans. And he walked by faith. He never told anyone of his needs. Whenever there was a need, he would just pray. And God would answer prayer. He wrote a great biography. I love the title of the biography. It's called... A million and a half answers to prayer. A million and a half answers to prayer. And in that biography, he tells about what happened one morning. They woke up and there was no food in the cupboards. There was not even a crumb that was there. And 
one of the little orphans said, Mr. Mueller, what is for breakfast this morning? And he said, well, let's put out the plates and we'll see what the Lord will provide. So we sat the children down and he began to pray, Lord, we thank you. You've never seen the righteous forsaken or their seed begging bread. And as he's praying, all of a sudden, there was a knock at the door. He opened the door. It was the baker from down the street. The baker said, do uh, you know what, Mr. Mueller? God woke me up at 3 o'clock this morning and told me that your orphans were going to need bread today. So I baked a, baked a bunch of extra bread. Here's this bread for the orphans. Oh, thank you, he said. He took the bread and they began to put it on the plates of all of the orphans. When the last piece of bread was put on the plate, all of a sudden there was another knock at the door and Mr. Mueller opened the door and there was the milkman. And the milkman said, you know what? He said, my cart broke down right across the street here from your orphanage. He said, all of my milk is going to spoil and go bad. Would you like to have all of my milk? And those little orphans learned that our God is a God who answers prayer. Maybe you feel like you're in a wilderness and you need God to provide for your need. His help is only a prayer away. You're in a the wilderness. Then all of a sudden, the psalm transports you to a dungeon. And there you find captives that are bound. They need deliverance. They need to be set free. In verse 10 to verse 16, those who sat in darkness and in the shadow of death, bound in afflictions and irons, because they rebelled against the words of God and they despised the counsel of the Most High, Therefore he brought down their heart with labor. They fell down and there was none to help. But then they cried out to the Lord in their trouble and he saved them out of their distresses. He brought them out of darkness and the shadow of death. He broke their chains in pieces. Oh, that man would give thanks to the Lord for his goodness and his wonderful works to the children of men. Why? For he is broken the gates of bronze, and he has cut the bars into. God answers the prayer of the person who needs to be set free. Now, the Old Testament saints, as they're reading this portion of Psalm 107, they couldn't help but think of what happened when they went into captivity. The Babylonians came and led them away by chains and put them in dungeons and put them in prisons and put them under slave labor. But they cried out to the Lord and the Lord brought them out of that bondage. As the New Testament believers were reading this portion, perhaps they thought, of the demoniac of Gadara. You remember the story in Mark chapter 5. Jesus and the disciples, they crossed the Sea of Galilee to that northeast corner, that region called Gadara. And when they come ashore, there's a man that comes running out, possessed with demons. And Jesus said, what is your name? And he said, Legion, for we are many. Legion was 6,000 Roman soldiers. I take the Bible literally. I see no good reason to believe that that man was possessed with 6,000 demons. That's a person who is bound. And yet Jesus set that person free to show that whom the Son sets free is free indeed. And there is no person that is beyond the reach of God. There is no person that is so bound and in such darkness. There is no prodigal that is too far. There is no son or daughter that's too addicted to drugs or alcohol or pornography. That Jesus Christ cannot set that person free. God answers the prayers of his people for freedom. And for deliverance, I like a great hymn by Charles Wesley called Amazing Love. I especially like the third verse of that hymn. The third verse, I love these words. He writes, Long my imprisoned spirit lay, fast bound in sin and nature's night. Thine eye diffused a quickening ray. I woke. The dungeon flamed with light. My chains fell off. My heart was free. 
I rose, went forth, and followed thee. Amazing love, how can it be that thou, my God, shouldst die for me? Maybe you are struggling with some sort of addiction or bondage in your life. Maybe you know someone in your life who is in a very dark place. I tell you what, God's help is only a prayer away for you or for that person. No matter how deep and dark the situation, God is there and will answer your prayer. I believe everyone should read a book written by Corey Tim Boom called The Hiding Place. When Billy Graham read that book, he made a movie about it. He was so impacted by it. it tells the story of the Tin Boone family in World War II during the days of the Nazis who were trying to exterminate the Jews. And the Tin Boone family, they lived in Holland. And because they believed the Jews were God's people in the living quarters above their watchmaking shop, they carved a hole in the wall and made a hiding place to smuggle the Jews out. Eventually the Gestapo found out and they were all arrested and sent to prisons camp, camps. And Corey and her sister Betsy were sent to that notorious prison camp called Ravensbrook. The conditions there and the things that happened there were so horrible they are beyond describing. But I like the part of the book in the movie so much when Betsy looks at Corey and she says, we're going to get out of here. We're going to get out of here. And then she says this, and when we do, we're going to go all around the world we're going to tell people that there is no pit where our God is not deeper still. There is no pit so deep where our God is not deeper still. And God answered their prayer. Mm -hmm. Betsy got out by going to heaven and Corey got out and began to tell everybody there is no pit so deep that our God is not deeper still. I tell you, God answers the prayer in the wilderness. God answers the prayer in the dungeon. Then all of a sudden you're transported from the dungeon to a hospital. And there you see sick people lying on their deathbed. No hope for them. But they pray, they cry out to the Lord. In, in verse 17 to verse 22, fools because of their transgression and because of their iniquities were afflicted. Their soul abhorred all manner of food and they drew near to the gates of death. And they cried out to the Lord in their trouble, and he saved them out of their distresses. He sent his word, and he healed them, and he delivered them from their destructions. Oh, that men would give thanks to the Lord for his goodness and for his wonderful works to the children of men. Let them sacrifice the sacrifices of thanksgiving and declare his works with rejoicing. You see in verse 18, they're so sick they drew near to the gates of death, but they cried out to the Lord in verse 20. He sent his word and he healed them. God answers prayer when people are sick and near death and can heal them. Now the Old Testament saints, when they're reading this portion of the psalm, they couldn't help but think of King Hezekiah in 2 Kings chapter 20, the Bible tells us that he got sick, really sick. And Isaiah the prophet came to him and said, The Lord has told me that you're going to die. And Isaiah walked out the door. And the Bible says that Hezekiah turned his face to the wall. And he began to pray, Oh Lord, please don't let me die. Please touch me, Lord. Please heal me, Lord. Please answer my cry. Isaiah is walking across the palace and all of a sudden the Lord speaks to him and says, turn around and go back in there and tell him he's going to be healed. And God answered the prayer of Hezekiah. New Testament believers, as they were reading this portion of Psalm 107, they couldn't help but think of how Jesus healed the centurion's servant. You remember there's a centurion that came to Jesus one day and he said, my servant is so sick he's about to die. And Jesus said, well, I'd be glad to come and pray for him. And that centurion had such faith. He said, you don't need to come to my house. Just say the word. Just say the word. And Jesus said, I have found such great faith. Go your way. He's healed. And with just the word of Jesus, Jesus touched him and healed him. 
The Bible says in Exodus 15 and 26, God says, I am the Lord who healeth thee. I am Jehovah Rapha. When Jesus was on this earth, he healed so many people of so many different illnesses and situations. And this Bible says in Hebrews 13 and verse 8 that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And I've seen it happen. I remember years ago when Raul Reese was diagnosed with leukemia and we prayed. And three days later, God healed him. I remember when my wife's grandmother, we called her granny when she was diagnosed with cancer. And we didn't feel it was her time, and so we began to pray. And she was reading her Bible one day. She was reading Psalm 118, and her eyes fell on verse 17. You will live and not die and declare the wonderful works of God. You will live and not die and declare the wonderful works of God. And the Lord touched Granny and healed her. Years later, she got perfect healing. She went to heaven. <laughs> like with Pastor Chuck, we prayed that the Lord would heal him. And God says, I'm going to give him the perfect healing. <laughs> and Jesus still heals people today. <laughs> if you're sick, if you know someone who's sick, God's help in that situation is only a prayer away. But you're transported to a wilderness, and then a dungeon, and then a hospital, and now all of a sudden, verse 23 to 32, you're out in the middle of the ocean and there is a terrible, horrible storm. Verse 23, those who go down into the sea, to the sea in ships, who do business on great waters, they see the works of the Lord and his wonders in the deep, for he commands and raises the stormy wind, which lifts up the waves of the sea. They mount up to the heavens. They go down to the depths. Their soul melts because of trouble. They reel to and fro and stagger like a drunken man and are at their wits. And you can see it. Do you feel like you're there? <laughs> I don't know if you've ever been on a cruise ship in the middle of a storm. We have. No fun. And the waves are going up, and then you go down, and then they go up, and you go down. And they're reeling to and fro. They're staggering like a drunken man on the deck of the ship. And notice their, this phrase at the end of verse 27, and they are at their wit's end. Ever been there? I have so many times. Lord, I don't know what to do. I'm in the middle of such a horrible storm. I've never seen anything like it. I've never been through anything like this before, God. And I don't know what to do. I asked this person. They didn't know what to do. I asked that person. They didn't know what to do. God, I even Googled it. And, and I, I didn't, still don't know what to do. <laughs> what do you do when you're at your wit's end? Oh, the next verse. Then they cried out to the Lord in their distresses. And he brings them out of their distresses. He calms this storm so that the waves are still. Then they are glad because they are quiet. And so he guides them to their desired haven. Oh, that men would give thanks to the Lord for his goodness and for his wonderful works to the children of men. Let them exalt him also in the assembly of the people and praise him in the company of the elders. Oh, I like this. When you are in the worst storm, God's help is only a prayer away, only a prayer away. God's people in the Old Testament, the Old Testament saints, when they read this portion of the psalm, they couldn't help but think of Job. Everything was going so well in his life. Such a godly, wonderful man. And then in one day, in one day, it all changed. And he entered the worst storm you could ever imagine. He didn't understand what was going on in his life. You talk about being at your wit's end. And yet the Lord brought him out of it and made his end even greater than his beginning. Oh, God answers prayer. New Testament believers, as they're reading this portion of Psalm 107, they couldn't help but think of Jesus on the Sea of Galilee. <laughs> Remember, they're out in the middle of the Sea of Galilee. Jesus is asleep, asleep in the back of the boat. All of a sudden, this terrible storm comes up out of nowhere. And the disciples are freaking out. <laughs> and they wake Jesus up. Help us, help us, help us! 
And Jesus speaks to the winds and the waves. The Bible says immediately, immediately it went calm. There was no sloshing around. It went flat. Immediately. And Jesus can do that in your life, in my life, when we find ourselves in terrible, stormy situations, if we call out to God in prayer. I uh, like Psalm 37 in verse 19. The psalmist there writes, Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers them out of them all. One of my favorite verses in the Bible is Psalm 50 and verse 15. Here's what God says. Call on me in the day of trouble, and I will deliver you, and you will glorify me. Call on me in the day of trouble, and I will deliver you, and you will glorify me. Listen, God answers prayer when you're in the middle of a storm. God can answer prayer in the wilderness. God can answer prayer in the dungeon. God can answer prayer in the hospital. God can answer prayer out in the middle of a stormy ocean. God can turn absolutely any situation around. That's the point of verse 33 to 42. Read quickly of what he says there. It's amazing. You see how quickly God can just turn something around. Verse 33, he turns rivers into a wilderness and the water springs into dry ground, a fruitful land into barrenness for the wickedness of those who dwell in it. That's what happened to the people in the Old Testament. They went into captivity and their land was turned into a wilderness. But then in a moment, then in a moment, verse 35, he turns the wilderness into pools of water and dry land into water springs. And he makes the hungry dwell there that they may establish a city for a dwelling place and sow fields and plant vineyards that they may yield a fruitful harvest. He also blesses them and they multiply greatly and he does not let their cattle decrease. When they are diminished and brought low through oppression, affliction and sorrow, he pours contempt on princes and he causes, causes them to wander in the wilderness where there is no way. Yet he sets the poor on high, far from affliction. In a moment he can turn it around. And he makes their families like a flock. The righteous see it and rejoice, and all iniquity stops its mouth. What's the point? God can turn any situation, no matter what that situation is, it may not be a wilderness. It may not be a dungeon. It may not be a hospital. It may not be a stormy sea. But he can take any situation and turn it around in a moment. And the psalm ends with these beautiful words. Verse 43, whoever is wise, whoever is wise will observe these things and they will understand the loving kindness of the Lord. Are you a wise person? Whoever is a wise person will observe these things. What things? What things? Well, when you're in the wilderness, God will answer your prayer. When you're in the dungeon, God will answer your prayer. When you're in the hospital, God will answer your prayer. When you're in the middle of a storm, God will answer your prayer. In any circumstance or situation, God will answer your prayer. Because our God is a God who answers prayer. Whoever is wise will read the psalm over and over and over again and cry out to the Lord in whatever trouble they're in, whatever situation they're in. Whoever is wise will observe these things, will realize that no matter who you are and that no matter where you are, if you cry out to God, he will hear, he will answer your prayer. There is no more dramatic, powerful, unforgettable illustration of this that I know of than the true story of a lady named Janelle McMillan. Her to story is told in a great book written by Jim Symbol, the pastor of the Brooklyn Tabernacle in New York. A great book called Breakthrough Prayer. Janelle McMillan writes, The morning of September 11, 2001 began for me like many others. I got to work a little after 8 a.m. and rode the elevator up to the 64th floor of the North Tower of the World Trade Center where I worked. 
I was making small talk with a co-worker when I heard a loud explosion. I had no idea that American Airlines Flight 11 had just slammed into the building. A few moments later, the building began swaying and rocking. Oh my God, I said, this building is going down. Knowing we had to leave, we headed to stairway B, and as we ran it down together, we kept counting the stairs. 63, 62, 61, 60, 59, 58. And as we were going down the stairs, we could see the firefighters going up the stairs. When we reached the 13th floor, all of a sudden, the whole building just went boom. Everything went black. The building started to collapse. 110 floors were coming down on top of us. Falling concrete and debris smashed me down onto my knees and my eyes and mouth filled with grit and dust. It was surreal, like a horrible dream. There is nothing we could do and nowhere we could go. We were being buried alive and the sound of it was deafening. Then as suddenly as it started, it stopped. And things got quiet. Really quiet. My mind started racing. I thought of my husband, my children, and my family. How I would never see them again. So there, all alone, in the dark, buried under all that rubble. I began to pray. Oh, God, help me. I cried. Help me. Please let me live. Please let them find me. The minutes seemed like hours, and the hours seemed like days. But then I heard the sound of rescue workers above me. I began crying out, help me, help me, help me. Finally, someone yelled back, hello, hello, is someone in there? I said, yes, my name is Janelle, help me. By now I could see a bit of daylight coming through a crack. So I stuck my hand up through it. Can you see my hand? I shouted. Someone grabbed a hold of it. Janelle, I've got you, you're going to be all right. Oh, thank you, Lord, thank you, Lord, thank you, Lord, I prayed. It had been 27 hours since the towers collapsed. And I, Janelle McMillan, was the last survivor to be pulled out of the wreckage that had once been the World Trade Center towers. I spent weeks in the hospital recovering. The doctor said I'd never walk again, but I do. And I am living proof that God's help is only a prayer way that wherever you are and whoever you are, if you cry out to God, he will hear and answer your prayer.